What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to Racially Speaking, where we have real and honest conversations about race as it's viewed through the lenses of faith, family, and vocation. As always, I'm your host, David Phipps, and you're listening to episode 16. Today, I'm once again joined by a former guest, host of the amazing Roll Down podcast as part of the Chasing Justice podcast network, all around justice advocate, and truly an encyclopedia of some sports knowledge. Um, I'm joined by Alethea Lamberson. Leith, thanks for popping in again. Yeah, no, it's always fun to join you and yeah, ba- fun to be back on and man, encyclopedia of sports info. Whew, you that's gotta like add a that. little pressure on there. Add that to your profile. <laughs> no, but, I appreciate uh, the warm welcome. Yeah. So we've been trying to do this for a minute, like it feels yeah. like months. It's, it's at least mm-hmm. been weeks. So finally... I think I said this last episode with Ashley, but the stars have aligned. We've been able to pull this off <laughs> a nice mid afternoon. We don't even have to take up our evening. Nice. Yes. <laughs> so here we go. Like I said, yeah, I mean, seriously, encyclopedia of knowledge as far as, I mean, a lot of stuff goes, but sports and we touched on a lot, um, on our first episode with, mm-hmm. um, we talked about, um, a lot, the women's game. We talked a lot about basketball. We talked about the money involved and obviously mm-hmm. all of the, racial components involved with and just how everything's just interconnected I personally mm-hmm. learned so much I had a ton of feedback from that I'm just like wow that was really eye-opening I think to a lot of people too wow um, and since then tons of stuff has happened of course along these same lines yep. right on like right on cue with what we were talking about and kind of opened up so I've been wanting to have you back for a while to kind of put <laughs> a bow on some of these conversations. Well, I mean, they're ever-changing, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, specifically, I mean, we can even start here. The Olympics just finished up a few weeks ago, so I wanted to kind of um, talk about that a little bit. And, I mean, there were mm-hmm. stories from before it started, during, the during while they're going on, a couple weeks, and, and after. Um, so plenty of stuff to get to. So, yep. all right, let's just start with, what I would think is the biggest name involved and mm-hmm. Miss Simone Biles. Ah, the goat. Ar- I was going to say, arguably, <laughs> I mean, she's 24, I think, right? Has a resume yeah. to be considered the greatest athlete of all time. Mm-hmm. Truly. Um, she truly does. Which we, we could do a whole episode just on her probably. But mm-hmm. let's start off with the news surrounding her and kind of not what we expected, right? Going yeah. into the Olympics, like I said, greatest athlete of all time potentially. Certainly in that argument, for sure the greatest gymnast of all time and mm-hmm. just amazing, amazing athlete. So everyone in the world literally could not wait to see see her do her thing. Mm-hmm. We took a turn. Um, gymnastics competition ramped up and she's not performing and largely did not perform, except I think, mm-hmm. was it one, kind of one and a half times. Mm-hmm. And she, and so she ends up... Uh, at first, it seemed like it might have been an injury, but overall, she cites her her mental health. She wasn't in it mentally. Mm-hmm. And of course, with being a gymnast, she fears for her safety and whatnot, but she is unapologetic about prioritizing her mental health. Mm-hmm. She took a back seat um, and uh, bowed out yep. for the most part. So, what are your, I guess, what were your initial thoughts hearing all that and then seeing, I don't know, all the different news sources cover it and outlets cover it and just what is your overall take we'll open up the conversation a little wider with mental health a little bit but for right now like on Simone Biles doing that yeah um I would say probably like a number of other people initial shock like I remember Mm -hmm. I think I was on uh, Instagram and just doing my you know daily scroll and I see the first report like breaking news Simone Biles out of the team competition I'm like what (laughs) hold on right And then it was like possible injury, you know, and then, you know, seeing her vault, I was like, oh, okay. Like she landed super awkwardly, Mm -hmm. probably. Right. Like, um, and then it evolved like an hour later, actually there's, you know, she's just out right now a little bit later. Right. Um, she's saying, Hey, I, it's a mental health thing. Like I can't, I can't compete. And, um, and so I think for me, it was, uh, just sitting with that and trying to understand. So I, I just was kind of inundating myself with uh, some of the stories that were coming out. And I feel like how quickly other gymnasts were responding, right? You had a lot of athletes respond um, in general, but like 
other gymnasts because after what not what came out long after that was about the twisties right and so just um i'm not a gymnast i can barely do a cartwheel right but Mm. even in that it's like am i gonna land okay (laughs) you know i can't even do a somersault yeah so it's you know um learning about uh, another layer there for gymnasts in particular for me i just had so much compassion and empathy for her on um, you had to prioritize your, your health and how dangerous as I learned more about what the twisties were. Um, and even like saw a couple of videos to the point where I was like, I can't watch any more of these cause that freaks me out. And I don't want to see someone get injured in that way. Yeah. Um, but really how dangerous it would have been for her to be flipping on the beam or the vault again, or even she's got moves named after her that no one else in the world can yeah. do. And so, all the flips and stuff she does on floor and just the, the fear that came with that, like, will you land it? And so um, I, I think for me, it was after getting through the initial shock, just being like, well, yeah, you know, like Simone has nothing to prove to anybody. Nothing. Now, as yeah. a, as a fan, of course, like that's part of sports. We, we, we get to see the best in the world compete in their very sports, the Olympics every four, but for this time, every five, now <laughs> five years later, mm-hmm all the anticipation and excitement around that. And, and so I think there was just such sadness, but also a, like, um, we've seen Simone compete. We know what she's capable of and she doesn't need to entertain us solely. So we can say, Oh, we watched her do. She's in a category of her own. She's already in a category of her own. She doesn't need more medals to prove that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I also had a lot of respect for her, um, as, you know, in gymnastics, she's old, you know, like she's older. Right. Um, (laughs) and so for her to have the maturity to say, I'm not going to just try to push myself through this and potentially injure myself, but also jeopardize my team when you're competing in this team final, right. We know all of those scores matter. And the Russian Olympic committee, they had a heck of a, um, you know, the, the, what they did before to get into the team final, right? Like they performed well. And so I think I just had a lot of respect for Simone as well, um, for her to say, I'm going to make the mature decision to step back and let there be opportunity for these other women to compete and look what happened. Right. Jade Carey, Suni, <laughs> Suni Lee, yes. right? You, you yeah. saw phenomenal performances for women who are so skilled and can compete. No, they're not at Simone Biles level in a lot of ways, but they're good. I've they're some of the best in the world. dedicated their lives to do it. Just exactly. Like too, yeah. Right. And so you have, you know, two of them, it was Grace McCollum, right. And Jade Carey who thought, well, okay, well I did, I competed. And there was, um, oh, I'm blanking on her name right now. The other blonde, um, oh, I can see her face. So I'm blanking on her name right now, but the three of them, I right. It was too. like, um, they weren't going to be able to do some of the things that they got to. But when Simone said, I need to set back, it was like, yeah. here's opportunities now that you get to do on a world stage Mm -hmm. that you didn't even think you were going to get to, um, whether it was a team final or in an individual event. And so I just, my respect for Simone grew immensely. Um, and it was so cool to see those women step into that moment and Jordan Childs, she wasn't even warmed up. She wasn't supposed to compete in the team final. And then literally it's like, Oh, Simone's taking off her, you know, I don't know what they're called, but the stuff on her hands for bars, Jordan, you're up. Yep. No time to warm up. Yeah. You're in, girl. And she crushed it, yeah. right? And so it's one of those moments as an athlete, you just got to be ready to go. Mm-hmm. You don't know the whole thing. You don't know when your name or number is going to be called. And and so I think it was just really cool in the midst of how probably difficult that was for Simone on such a world stage in the world of social media for her to make such a mature decision as a leader and as a teammate. And then yeah. she was the ultimate teammate, cheering, carrying stuff for them, cheering them on, like, you just see her, the, her humanness in the midst of that too. And I think so much for younger athletes to even learn yeah. from of, it's not just about how you perform, what you do, how, how you contribute point wise or whatever. It's who you are as a teammate. And yeah. I think Simone modeled that so beautifully. So that's a really what, from, from that vantage point, you know, some of what I was, um, enjoying, but also sad. But like I said, empathy, compassion for her and so much respect for her, um, in that decision. Yeah. I love the press conference afterwards. I mean, I can't mm. think of a better example of like, it's an individual sport, but a team sport coming together at the same time. Like mm-hmm. they were both like, no, you're great. No, you're great. Like she was yeah. kind of like these, these, you know, young ladies are my teammates. They're silver medalists. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. And they got to do this because I stepped back and they were just like, 
they weren't even having that there. No, no, no. We are like, yeah. this is Simone's team. Like she's our mm-hmm. mentor. And yeah, it was, that was awesome. Mm-hmm. Right, I'm going to come back. We'll come back to her in a bigger conversation in a second. So even before the Olympics, right. You have, uh, we have, um, Shakira Richardson. Mm-hmm. I think it was a matter, you might know more, um, the specifics, but I think it was like within like a three day span. I remember seeing, you know, the feeds of like, wow, watch out for Shakira Richardson. She's blowing up. Like is, I don't know. It seemed like she was favored to mm-hmm. win all these events and, uh, track and field. And then a few days later, she fails a drug test, suspended. And then, you know, media outlets break loose of giving opinions one way or the other mm-hmm. of whether or not that's fair. Is it her fault? Are the rules unfair? So all these conversations that I think are valuable to have, regardless yep. of what you think. Um, so what, where did you land with this one? Because it was a bit different mm-hmm. than, well, obviously way different than with Simone Biles. Yeah. Um, so she, again, to be, she got suspended and then the result, so it wasn't specifically, hey, you're not competing in Olympics. It was just the amount of time she had to be suspended, yep. you know, made it so she couldn't be at the Olympics after all the training and qualifying and stuff. So what what did you think about that narrative, that short narrative taking place? Yeah, I had a lot of, a lot of feelings and thoughts about that. Mm-hmm. And and actually, she she still could have gone to Tokyo. And, you know, and I think that because her suspension was 30 days, the 30 days ended before the four by one was set to compete. Oh, okay. And so she still could have gone. So that's part of what for me is factored into, into what I feel about the situation. Um, hmm. I think first and foremost, uh, a, just a depth of sadness. Um, I don't know what Shakira's relationship was like with, with her mother. Um, you know, just from the little, I picked up uh, difficult and challenging, uh, but obviously still something to where it caused a lot of grief and sadness for her. And as someone who has lost their mom and these are not comparable, but they're that sadness like that. And the way she found out, um, I believe when she shared that it was a reporter who brought it up in an interview where she found this news out. And so we so often disconnect the athlete from being human, right? This is some of the conversations we've had for the last couple of years now, right? And I can't imagine you're at the track, you've competed and you're doing your post-race interview and a stranger who doesn't even know your situation mm-hmm. says, hey, I heard that your biological mother has died. I, I can't imagine the shock and the, yeah. the grief and the sadness that came that fell on Shakari in that moment in the days after and then how people cope, right? We want to dehumanize people so often in the ways that they cope without Mm -hmm. knowing their story, without knowing their circumstances. And we do that with athletes often because all we see is what's portrayed in the media and what they might share publicly themselves. And so we see Shakari demonized so quickly in the way that she chose to cope with her grief. So so let's give, so backtracking. So she... Mm -hmm is finds out from a reporter that her biological mother has passed away and then the Mm -hmm. coping. So the drug test she failed was marijuana usage. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, um, not performance enhancing and this isn't a plug for marijuana usage. It's just, it's a (laughs) contextual piece that it's, it's not like she was on performance enhancing drugs because that Mm -hmm. I think would be a no brainer of, yeah. And a completely different conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not, you know, it's a banned substance, so mm-hmm. we'll we'll say that. So mm-hmm. it's uh, we're not saying the drug test is necessarily unfair, but I think it's helpful. Like we're we're having the conversation mm-hmm. of okay, well, is this a good rule? And I think like you're saying, fail, failing to empathize and hear someone's story and just mm-hmm. looking at the their humanity is what what's so much missed. So anyway, keep yeah, keep going. So so much right, and and so for me. <clears throat> It was, um, you know, Shakari admitted, I knew what I was doing, yeah. right? So there was a humility in the midst of her grief to own her actions, right? Which I, I thought was um, prof- pro- profound for her yeah. to, to name that and say, I, I knew, right? And yet in the midst of her grief, anyone who's walked through tremendous grief, it's so layered, right? Again, this is not, I'm not excusing her choice of coping or anything like that. Right. Um, 
what was really for me frustrating about how that unfolded was um, what it did was it revealed, um, I think, a, what's an issue with the rules, right? I yeah. was like so perplexed. I was like, hold on. It's the World Anti-Doping Agency. This is not a performance enhancing right. thing that she did. Hold on. So I literally like looked it up like, yeah. okay, what am I missing? Because you're, you're penalizing her, yes, for a failed drug test because of the THC in marijuana. I, I hear you. However, why is this still part of the rules? Mm-hmm. Now, I know that they've evolved. They've been challenged immensely. However, <laughs> I think it, what it did is it revealed in our layer of you really need to do a thorough review of these rules because often what we hear when an athlete is suspended or they have their medal stripped from them is because they were using performance enhancing yes. uh, drugs, right, to increase their performance, right? Yep. So I think even the 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 confusion around that a little bit. Um, but again, yes, THC is a banned substance. She, her, she failed a drug test and she admitted that. Okay, so we can go on for hours about what should be banned, what shouldn't, how the rules need to change. The rules do need to change. It's 2021. Mm-hmm. The rules need to change. Yeah. Okay, so that's, a, I think, another layered conversation. So Shikari is penalized for her actions, which she owned and admitted and acknowledged, right? So my point of, another point of frustration is, um, and the media is going to be the media. Like they're going to, they're going to humanize her and demonize her all at the same time. Mm -hmm. Right. Which I thought a lot of it was really unfair and unkind in some ways. Um, but then you get to USA, it was either USA track and field, I believe who, who they name, here's our athletes that we're taking to Tokyo. Right. And so Shikari's ban was 30 days. It could have been up to three months. So Mm -hmm. anti-doping agency said 30 days because there was some kindness in their decision. And so then it was like, well, if it's only 30 days, Shikari can go to Tokyo and be potentially be a final person for USA and four by one team. So for me, it was, okay, you know, she was not here using performance enhancing drugs. Yeah. Her mom died and she found that from a reporter. Okay. Yeah. And there's still a chance for her to go compete. And USA track and field said, well, other athletes, you know, they worked hard and there's some fluff response like that. I remember mm. reading about it. And so we're going to take the sixth and seventh finishers from, from the meet. And I thought that to me is the lack of, they started off their response with, we have so much compassion or whatever they said to try to be kind towards Shikari. But to me, I thought it was a decision, an er- heiress decision to say, we're not going to still give her an opportunity when she's actually eligible based on the Olympic standards to still compete. And so I thought that was yeah. very unkind um, mm-hmm. and lacked a lot of compassion. Yeah. Um, and it's like, she carries one of the best in the world right now. So she has since competed and did not do as well. But again, there's a lot factored into that. She hadn't competed in a month. I can't imagine all, even some of the pressure that came and all that right. stuff. Right. That's At another the time she was one of the best. Exactly. And so, I thought, oh, well, they said 30 days. Like, she'll still get to go to Tokyo and compete. And then they're like, yeah, we're not going to take her. And I was like, Mm -hmm. what? But but why? She had the fastest time. Like, what? you want to take the best in the world. Why would you not take her? And she's Mm -hmm. eligible to go. And so that for me was really frustrating. So that was factored into the decision or how I felt about the situation as well. Um, And then this might, I might might take this a little bit further than you're ready to go. So you can say, hold up, we'll get there, Leith. Um, but the, and I texted you about this, right? So Shikari is not allowed to go to Tokyo, right? Um, and she's not chosen to go, um, even though she could have been. And, you know, marijuana, THC and CBD, part of it, right? So we know this has evolved, right? The use of cannabis, the CBD oil, all of that has grown immensely in the last yeah. several years for a lot of athletes as well. It's part of recovery, sleep, some of those things that are really helpful and are natural sedatives to use. So Shikari isn't able to go to the Olympics because of use of marijuana, which includes CBD. And Megan Rapino at the Olympics is promoting her sister's company mm. that what yeah. they produce is contained CBD. And I thought, hmm, yeah. well, this feels a little I- ironic and confusing and v- actually pretty frustrating. Um, and I'm like, Megan, honey, um, this is not the time. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
all the controversy surrounding Shakari and her not even being chosen to still go compete in Tokyo. And then you're going to promote a company at the Olympics that contains an element in which was contributed to Shakari yeah. not being able to come. Not saying Megan shouldn't support her sister and be an ambassador, but yeah. homie, do it after the Olympics. Yeah. Like re- read the room is what I felt like. And, and so again, people are going to be like, well, it's not about race and, I'm not saying that's a main factor in this convert in this part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. What I will say is we can see some things present, right? Even if race isn't a main factor, it's still part of the equation. Yeah. And so I thought that was, um, I was fresh. I was mad when I saw Megan's post uh, about promoting CBD uh, products at the Olympics and everything was like, everyone was like, Oh, it's fine. Of course. Like it's not a banned substance. It's fine. And so again, I think we saw, we just seen some of the, um, I don't know what the word is for it, but impartial, impartial, maybe impartial. That's part of it is, but just some of the differences that were at play there and how the conversations even surround some of the different situations. Right. And so Mm -hmm. it the, the condemnation that came from Megan's posting was from fans of Shikari, really. Um, and some of general sports fans too, I think was there, but the media didn't do that from what I saw. Right. And so yeah. even media is such a factor in these situations too. So anyways, those are some of my thoughts about, yeah uh, about that. And, I like, um, yeah. I like how you said it's not the, I, I'm going to butcher it, but, um, might not be the biggest factor, but is a contributing factor? Is that what you said? Race. Race yeah. Race it, it's still present. Yeah. In you got to talk. I got to talk about it. Whether it's whether we're saying it's the main thing or not, it's present. Yeah. I think is mm-hmm. worth putting out there. Which I mean, kind of brings us, which we touched on this a little bit. I think I saw you post about it um, at some point. But bringing up race, which we're obviously going to. So <laughs> Michael Phelps. Mm-hmm. Talk about him for a second. So um, I think I even saw you post this at some point. I'm not sure, but. Michael oh, Phelps yeah. back in the day um, got in trouble. And this is a while ago, so it, it mm-hmm. wasn't uh, everything wasn't being legalized as rapidly and and whatnot. So there's that layer to it. Um, was I don't know if it's caught the right word. That sounds like we're in high school, but uh, <laughs> caught using or smoking marijuana. I think maybe just at a party or something. I don't know. It was something mm-hmm. like that recreationally. Um, not judging him just is what it is, but mm-hmm. I think I saw you compare that to our reaction to Michael Phelps, who is a, an American swimming Olympian God, athletic, you know, mm-hmm. athletic Mount Rushmore type person, yeah. um, white male, obviously. And then I saw you making a comparison to how people are collectively viewing mm-hmm. Shakari Richardson and all this. So mm-hmm. I'm making you talk about it. Can you unpack that a little bit? Because the way the way I see it, I'll play devil's advocate a little bit. I don't have I absolutely think there's a racial component in these mm-hmm. conversations, but to be helpful, I'll play devil's advocate a little bit. Like <laughs> to me, those are I think they're probably different in a sense of because of when it happened, I guess. I don't mm-hmm. know if you'd agree with that. Like Shakari yeah. Yeah, yeah. admittedly sure. saying like she knows the rules, knew the rules, mm-hmm. knew what she was doing, even though it sucked, the results. Yep. And then, and, you know, the Olympics were happening um, Mm -hmm. weeks later. And then, you know, Michael Phelps, I think it, you know, happened nowhere near the Olympics during competition, stuff like that is what it is. So I think that maybe paints Mm -hmm. it in a different scenario, but overall people's responses, you still saw kind of a partiality to use some of your words. Yeah. I I think for me, um, you know, we have to factor in the differing uh, scenarios for sure. You know, I'm not out here saying every situation is the same. I'm not treating every situation the same. Mm -hmm. Um, The timing of stuff, right? Before the Olympics, after the Olympics, you know, for me, it's how does this fit into the bigger narrative and the bigger picture? I think we, um, we miss that a lot. We can use the U S as an example, right? When we want to say, well, like slavery happened 400 some years ago. So why are we still talking about it without Mm -hmm. understanding how that's factored into the the whole of history, U.S. history, and the present day implications of that, right? Um, and so we want to do these like disconnections. And so for me, it's um, as I've grown in my like 
um, understanding of history, of the interconnectedness of things like race and gender in these situations, um, the complexity and how layered and nuanced these situations are too. Like I kind of live in a, the nuanced space now um, after last year. And so mm-hmm. um, for me, it, you know, even in my, my post where I briefly mentioned, you know, the response towards Shakari and then the response toward like Michael Phelps or even Ryan Lochte, you know, to an extent yeah. and um, which has happened at the Olympics. Right. So you have, even there, you have three different situations, right. And different factors in those situations. So for me, I think it's, it's a miss if we don't pay attention to the narratives that are at play because they're connected to history and a larger picture. Right. So historically, if we're going to look so like at black women in particular, black women have always been and continue to be, treated and regarded so much differently in society across the board. And it Mm -hmm. happens also in sports. Okay. And so that, that's Mm -hmm. just, that's a thing. I'm not, I'm not just making that up or trying to make it something we have data to back that up. (laughs) It's an objective truth, right? Um, There's data to back those types of things up. We can look at news reports and stories to back all of that up. Right. And so for me, watching the response towards Shakari and how quickly she was uh, dehumanized, um, how quickly um, people dismissed her grief and just simply said, "Like, well, you were wrong, and that's your problem, and you should have you should have done better." <laughs> to me, what what I remember with 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 the response to Michael Phelps because he's such a decorated Olympian and winning eight me- gold medals, all of that, right? Um, mm-hmm. Shakari doesn't have that kind of status. Yeah. Right. All we saw was, damn, she's fast. And it's gonna be fun watching her against the Jamaicans at the mm-hmm. Olympics. Right. Mm-hmm. That was all we had. And so Shakari is treated one way, largely not saying there wasn't some compassion. A lot mm-hmm. of black women had compassion for Shakari first and foremost, from my, my sphere of, uh, news and input and conversations. Yeah. Right. Um, but the lack of grace towards I, and compassion uh, towards Shakari that was comparably shown from what I remember towards Michael Phelps. And so that's why I, I at least wanted to name it and acknowledge it and not say, oh, it's just this black, white thing. Well, no, that's only one element of the story, but it's connected to a larger history and picture. And we miss that <laughs> when uh, we make it, we just make it about the situation. It was this isolated incident or is this isolated situation and we disconnect it from the larger yeah. historical narrative that's been at play in our country and in sports here in the U S. And so for me, it was important. Like, I don't care if people don't like me making this connection. I'm going to, because I, I really think it's important that we have to pay attention to the language that's used, the posture that we, that's a, that's present. Uh, um, that's presently happening in the the midst of how those two situations unfolded um, and be able to connect the dots and respond and call out uh, some of the error or the double standard, which is often at play, the double standard um, in general. So uh, to me, that's a, I think it's a necessary connection to make. um, And it's a miss if we don't, in my opinion. Yeah. I think you almost, like we almost have to speculate a little bit and there's almost, there might not be much point to go here, but I'd be hard pressed to be convinced that if a Michael Phelps and we're hating on Michael Phelps, so we're not actually hating on him. It's not, just for not comparison. Hating on him at all. Yeah. Michael, it switched the two. Like you're saying, I'd be hard pressed to be convinced the results and reactions wouldn't be completely different. Got mm-hmm. no proof that that'd be true, but mm-hmm. you know, if we're, if Michael Phelps is right for the Olympics, it's, you know, caught with marijuana in the same way he did right before it you know like you're saying got to be careful with where are we and addressing and being honest about double standards i i gotta believe the committees we would find a way Mm. to get him to tokyo oh and make sure he's a thousand percent especially all the events especially if they say hey michael your ban is 30 days but you can still compete they would make sure he knew by one yep they would they would they would oh you can still compete and and we could continue to retain that title that mm-hmm. the U.S. men have held yep. for every Olympics. We're going to fight like hell to make sure you're there. We're no, going to no make doubt. that happen. But when you don't have the cred, no doubt, yeah, like Shakari doesn't yet. You know, it's a different it's a different conversation. Yeah, appreciate you diving in there. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, one <laughs> pun, more. In, pun intended there. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh man, I wish I would have caught that. <laughs> 
All right, one more big name and then a little yeah. bit broader, bigger conversation. So Miss Naomi Osaka. Ah, who's yeah. just yes. Oh man. Incredible. Incredible. Truly. Um young tennis star. If you know if you're lost, um, non sports people. Um, get familiar <laughs> with Naomi Osaka. She's yes. just an incredible advocate for justice racial justice specifically, mm -hmm. women's games. Um, she She's an incredible tennis star. And lately, as we've brought up with Simone Biles and Shakira Richardson in different ways, but Naomi Osaka has kind of become one of the poster people for mental health awareness, especially how we view athletes, particularly high-profile famous athletes. And it seems like the backdrop... Um, narrative is that athletes are becoming more aware of the need to take care of their mental health mm -hmm. and the result is, or how they do that is often taking time off, whether it's a game match, a tournament, a few games, um, whatever it is. And it's, it's that they need less time in front of the fans, which is a natural tension because fans, you know, Fans and athletes are the relationship. That's why sports, I mm -hmm. think, are great. Um, you know, people come together to watch sports, and the athletes know that more than anybody. So there's kind of a natural, I think, tension there already. Yeah. So what do you, what do you think about the rise in mental health, health, mental health awareness? I guess mm -hmm. with athletes and then the media and fans like us. Um, having to become more aware of it and understand where athletes are coming from with yeah. like, and again, I'll play before I let you go um, devil's advocate a little bit. Cause I think the pushback would be naturally that, well, it, it's, I won't touch the money thing, but like it's mm -hmm. their job. And I've heard comparisons like, you know, no one would have this reaction, you know, from athletes, no one would have this reaction if um, I took a personal day from my office job or something like yeah. that, which yep. I see makes, Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Um, I think it's a little different, but I'm also mm -hmm. completely understand the mental health needs. And so where do you land? Like, how, what do you think about players taking time off, especially at big moments? Like, uh, like Naomi, Naomi Osaka, I think, has dropped out of multiple terms. Just she's mm -hmm. like, I'm not mentally in it. I need yep. to take care of myself. Like yep. when people, you know, because the flip side is, you know, you've got, Mamba mentality, like Kobe Bryant mentality that mm -hmm. all the athletes pedal also like, you know, fans pay to come see me. Why would I ever take time off? Stuff like that. So like, how does all yeah. that work itself out? Yeah. Great question. Um, in general, I commend the athletes uh, for bringing a conversation like this to the spotlight. You know, I think some people act like athletes have never talked about mental health before. Mm -hmm the reality is that's not true. Um, athletes have been discussing mental health, dealing with it privately a lot um, yes. in ways that, that we as fans will never, ever know about, right? Um, it hasn't been until, you know, I think about when uh, Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan... I was going to bring Kevin Love up. Yeah, when they both publicly were like, yeah, like this has, I've battled depression, you know, all of, you know, just being a little more vulnerable about their their stories and their life. Um but the reality is athletes have um, navigated mental health issues for such a long time and really just talked about it privately, you know, with their people they're close to. It's never gotten the media attention that it now has. Right. And so, of course, more media attention means more opinions. Um, and so, you know, and generally speaking, I, I really do. I'm like proud of and really commend athletes for um, willing to to really um stand in their humanity. Again, I, I'll keep coming back to that because athletes, first and foremost, before they pick up a racket, before they throw a football, before they get on the track, they are human. They are humans with feelings and emotions and struggles, just like those of us who don't make millions of dollars competing in a sport. And so the fact that they're willing to say, no, like I've struggled with this and here's how, here's here's how I'm coping or here's how I navigate that. And I've battled it for years. Some of them will say, and we just found out about it six months ago, <laughs> you know? And so 
I, again, I think generally speaking, I'm really grateful that they've been so willing um, because I think about the number of athletes who have wanted to talk about it and they haven't. Yeah. And so they've dealt with it privately. And then you see the sad result of the number of athletes um, who end up, you know, doing, there's an extreme, right. Or taking their own life because of the mental health mm-hmm. um, struggles that they have. And they felt so isolated. And so for me, I, I'm like, I can't imagine an, a layer of freedom that potentially is coming to, you know, I've, I've been in the college, the college athlete world for years. And so I'm just thinking about the number of college athletes who um, hopefully feel this like, oh my gosh. So NBA players, um, Naomi Osaka, who is the wealthiest female athlete in the world is talking about this and pulling out of major matches. Mm-hmm. Um, Simone Biles, like I just, uh, Michael Phelps, right. He has talked about that yeah. at length too. And so t- I just can imagine, man, like how helpful their vulnerability and willingness to enter into that is. So on that, on that general layer, I'm, I'm really thankful that they've been that courageous. Um, with Naomi, you know, since we brought Naomi and, uh, watching her, um, you know, make the choice, I believe is at the French open to not show up for me- media availability. Right. And so I was mm-hmm. watching some of the chatter, um, from some journalists, right. Who cover sports. And, uh, there's definitely, I think <laughs> there was some empathy from people who weren't athletes, but then I see the athletes who have not taken up journalism, right. In some way. And, yeah. and obviously it's part of the contract. Athletes are supposed to show up for media availability, right. you know, makes me think of Marshawn Lynch, the famous, yeah, I'm yeah. here so I won't get fined, right? Or Greg and so, yeah, so it's like, they could do that. They could say, well, I don't want to get fined, so I'll sit down. I won't answer a single question, yeah. but I'll be here, mm-hmm. right? And so do we really want athletes that don't want to be there to do that every time? No. So it's just like, well, okay, then just don't make them show up. And so it, to me, it was interesting watching that particular situation unfold at the French open where again, it felt very, um, we're sad for Naomi. Right. But, um, we make money here. You have obligations and we're going to find you if you don't uphold those, um, Mm -hmm. because you're not special. I'm not saying Naomi should have been treated as a special case or uh, had any special treatment. I'm not saying that whatsoever. What I am saying is, when money is such a driver and that's just not in sports, right. In general, but in the sports world with money being such a driver and again, we should get access like crazy to athletes. That's our expectation and assumption. Um, so when you don't meet our standard, no matter what you've got going on, you're the problem and we're going to find you. And to me, the French open, which really was part of right. The, the four grand slams. So there's a whole committee for that. Um, I read on ESPN and whatnot, their responses and thought, well, that to me is lacking some compassion that you're still going to find her. And then Naomi said, well, then I'm just going to drop out. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to add that on where I'm going to be pressured to show up for media availability after every match or every practice. So I just won't be here. Mm -hmm. Why, why have to deal with that? If you already know, I'm not going to do it right. Because of what I'm dealing with behind the scenes that I don't need to tell people because that is, a very personal thing. We should not expect her to say, here's all my mental health struggles. So, and she did reveal, right. I think it was some yeah. social anxiety. Yeah. Right. And so, um, she wants to play tennis. You, She's not yeah. a, a journalism yeah, major I'm communications, like, and, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm not, and there's some, there's some phenomenal, um, journalists out there. So this is yeah. not a knock on them whatsoever. There are some that are not very good at what they do and ask really dumb mm-hmm. questions too, right? Mm-hmm. Like we've seen that across the board. Mm-hmm. And so I just think you're in the moment, especially when you're competing and you're getting pressed about these questions. And then it's like, people make it such a big deal. I'm like, but really it's about the competition, right? right. It's not necessarily about how they answer a question. Okay. So then it was this like, oh my gosh, like Naomi withdrew from the French Open. Is she going to show up at whatever uh, the major was coming up next, which she didn't. And then it was all of a sudden like, oh my gosh, okay. Um, We're so sorry. Let us, let us fix it. Right. You saw that, you saw that PR play of, oh my gosh, we did not think she would do that. Mm -hmm. And now we look bad. So let's protect our image and try to fix the problems. And again, I think, think that just even added some lack of compassion towards Naomi. And I, so I really applaud her um, for saying, 
I'm just not going to, I'm just not going to go there and compete because I, there's this pressure on me to perform and be someone that I'm not. And I actually can't be because of how it's going to affect me when I leave the court and when I leave the arena, because the journalists won't, they're not at her house. They're not hanging out with her. They're not in the recovery room, right? She's out of the spotlight when yeah. she leaves those spaces. Um, and people don't ever, I feel like people just don't ever consider that. Um, if you've yeah. never watched her, uh, she put out a limited series on Netflix. Um, it came out, I think, sometime in July. I saw that. I didn't um, know if it was a series or if it was one documentary. It's it's uh, three episodes. Okay. So um, I, watched, I watched it and because uh, I'm like, well, the fact that Naomi Osaka would do this and let people behind the scenes right. in this way because she is usually pretty private from yes. what I've noticed, I thought, oh, I really need to see this. Like, what is she going to share with people? And it definitely, um, she... I had so much compassion for her mm -hmm. um, watching this right now. This is going to be an interesting comparison and people may not like it, but I'm, I think it's helpful. So um, if you were around, uh, if you remember like Chris Brown, Rihanna, that whole, all of that unfolded mm -hmm. with their relationship and the drama and the violent domestic violence and all that. Right. And the narrative was solely about Chris Brown. Right. Yeah. Well, he released a documentary a few years ago and I watched it and I had similar feelings after watching Naomi Osaka's and the compassion I felt for him as a 16, 17, 18 year old. Um, Thank you. And, um, and how his life immediately went from this small town kid in Virginia to boom, Usher said you can perform and you're in yeah. the spotlight and your life has drastically changed. Watching Naomi Osaka's um, documentary on Netflix um, I had so much compassion for her, um, seeing how, when she beat Serena Williams, her life changed in an instant. Yeah. Yeah. In a moment, her life changed. It wasn't the, you know, there, there's a degree of the change that comes like when you've got, I've heard these stories countless times, right? You've got, um, football players who get drafted in the NFL. They're multimillionaires in a moment, life drastically changed yes. for them. And some of them don't have the community or the support or the, uh, character to handle that. Right. Um, for Naomi, you know, she's young, she's in her early twenties and you beat Serena Williams. And with that, it's so sudden, like at least with the NBA so players, sudden. they're preparing for that moment. Yes, and it happens in, a, in an instant. But they're preparing yep. for that their whole life, and they've yep. seen people get drafted mm -hmm. and all that. But she doesn't go into that thinking she's going to beat Serena Williams, and it does. It's like, oh, geez, like it's yeah. literally tied to money. And yeah, she's like, exactly. I just won millions and millions of dollars because I just, I just won a and game. And you beat Serena Williams. Yeah. I'm like, it, this is like a level that we, so many of us, cannot comprehend mm -hmm. of in the sports world what that means. Yeah. So your, yeah, your desire is I want to beat Serena Williams. I've looked up to her. I want to yeah. beat her. She's phenomenal, the best tennis player to ever come into the game, right? And arguably, it just in general, in an athlete conversation, yep. one of the greatest ever, right? And you beat her, yeah, on national television. And you saw the, if you remember when the, sh the, the shock on Naomi's face of like that, just, oh my gosh, overwhelmed. That just happened. Right. Well, so, all right. So here's, I got a couple hot takes and it's yeah. interconnected to even when she beat her. Cause that was like a weirdly controversial match and mm -hmm. where both women were kind of pitted against each other, which yes. happens also. Um, yep. You can go back and YouTube those videos if you don't know what we're talking about, but it's interconnected, <laughs> I think to this and here's, uh, you got to bring some of the racial elements into it because of what you said earlier of being aware of narratives. Mm -hmm. It's not lost on me and I'm not going to claim to be a huge tennis fan by, or kind of sore by any means, but it's not lost on me that Johnny McEnroe's made a oh, yeah. living during his playing times. And now um, even post, you know, post tennis off his temper and off of his, mm -hmm anger his yelling people think it's funny people emulate it and they're like yeah that's great um and he almost gets put up on a pedestal and revered for it mm -hmm. and then got serena williams um not happy with the referees and no not even close to a johnny McEnroe level mm -hmm. upset and painted as angry black woman mm -hmm. and then and that's matched specifically with naomi osaka um, it completely derailed her being able to even have fun winning that match because of 
yep. the narrative with between Serena and the referees and just mm-hmm. all that. And then even segueing to, man, you, you hit on all the segues, Netflix and mental health and different athletes. I just recently watched the uh, Mouse at the Palace documentary. Yeah. Um, um, documenting, well. yeah, documenting the um, famous brawl where the Indiana Pacers – um, between the Indiana Pacers, Detroit Pistons, what was that, 2004? Four. It was 2004. Was so long. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 20 years ago. Um, and, you know, Ron Artest, Steven Jackson, Jermaine O'Neal, uh, mm-hmm. get into it, go into the stands fighting fans. Mm-hmm. Sounds terrible saying it out loud. It was terrible. It was yeah. one of the worst things I've ever yeah. seen. But probably, that got to be the worst Yeah. Um, on sports, in sports. Um, go into the stands. Huge brawl breaks out after uh, a, a beer has been thrown and hits Ron Artest in the head. Um, it, I kind of, I've, I've honestly been a fan of Ron Artest his whole career, just as a mm-hmm. basketball player. But um, he was just always interesting to me because Very. he, in my in my mind, is the first person I heard talking about mental health, and mm-hmm. I, was, I was struck by how self aware he was. He's talking about his own mental health. Mm-hmm. And she's like, look, I, he is very aware, of, and I can't be put in these, this, this, and this situation. I'm not condoning what he did by any means. Yeah, yeah. But understanding the narrative of how all that took place, mm-hmm. and just how how much of a racist narrative was painted. You know, mm-hmm. thugs. These these black guys. Yeah. What are we doing? Giving them money, millions yep. of dollars to play a game. They, you know, they're coming mm-hmm. from these inner cities, and we're giving them millions of dollars, and they can't control themselves. Mm. And they're the fans aren't safe from them. You know, mm-hmm. how those, that language, I remember hearing that even as a kid. Yep. And, you know, we can talk about how dangerous that was as a little kid hearing that. Um, mm-hmm. And just what probably the overwhelming public's perception of a Ron Artest is at this point in his life. Like, mm-hmm. again, not condoning in any way what he did. Horrible. But understand, go watch that documentary, understanding yes. the elements Mm-hmm. of what was taking place of what's expected of these athletes put up uh, to have to put up with um, mm-hmm. in these scenarios. So anyway, connecting the mental health dots, I remember Ron Artest, you know, he, yeah, I'm a Lakers fan, won a, <laughs> won a ring with the Lakers. And then mm-hmm. so I remember him quickly saying, I'm, um, he auctioned it off right, right away mm-hmm. to do something with mental health. I don't know. And I was even struck by that. I was like, he's a weird dude. But it was <laughs> in hindsight, I'm like, he was trying, you know, how many people took him seriously yeah. when he's trying to talk about this? Mm-hmm. And then it wasn't until, I'm not saying I paid attention to every person that tried to speak up, but I feel like this mental health stuff took took off once Kevin Love started talking about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And not hating on anybody bringing this stuff up, but just these narratives of, oh, isn't, you know, he's one of the few white stars in the NBA it's not lost on me that that's just ironic that again, you got these mm-hmm. black guys bringing up these issues mm-hmm. early, early, early on, not just in sports and we don't take it seriously or as serious mm-hmm. it, as it needs to be taken until a Michael Phelps starts endorsing the, the company with the counseling online mm-hmm. counseling thing he does, which is great. Mm-hmm. Or Kevin Love starts talking about it after yeah. they win a championship with the Cleveland Cavaliers. It's just uh, narratives that are, like you said, uh, you know, where are we? Are we willing to call it these double standards? Mm-hmm. I think that are still just you know pervading every aspect, not just in sports, but um, I mean, sports alone permeates a lot mm-hmm. of other stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um- it's an, it, it's interesting. I, again, I think there's, I live in nuance. And so I think there's a lot of nuance to the conversation mm-hmm. and, um, you know, it's sad to a degree. I think when athletes have in the past tried to bring up mental health challenges and struggles and they're, yeah, they're overlooked or they're, you know, they're deemed not as strong, right? Like the whole athlete, um, mentality just in general of like, you just got to push through it. Don't matter how much you're injured, don't matter what you're dealing with. Like you just need to go out and perform like, I've, I've been in that mentality before. Um, and there's so much that's, that's factored into that. And so I do wonder after watching the malice at the palace, um, it's called, um, untold is a documentary. Yeah. And, um, I watched it a few weeks ago with uh, a couple friends and 
uh, remember that unfolding as a, I was 17 when that happened and, um, and was wild that the, all these years later, now they're talking about it and, and just even what that brings up for those men again. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I wonder, yeah, it, with Ron Artest, I, I just, I appreciated him walking us. He walks us through the documentary and even in the moment where he, he lays on the scorer's table, right. And everyone's like, that's disrespect. What was he doing? Blah, blah, blah. And he's saying, yeah. again, no one knew. And he's saying, I'm doing what my therapist told me yeah. to do so I could calm down in the situation. Like I'm laying down. Escalated yeah. because of mental yes. health issues. Yeah. And because, yeah. And I'm like, and if, if I'm trying to calm down and you throw a beer at me, mm -hmm. look, I'm probably, I'm going to be pissed. Okay. Yeah. Like, any, I think, no, I can't say any, a lot of people would have been mad. Not saying everyone would have gone in the sands to yeah. find the person, yeah, yeah. but there's an element of where he's a human who has been so violated. Yeah. And there's always been this, like in certain sports where, you know, fans can kind of do whatever they want, you know, and Especially that's, I don't want to get, yeah, yeah, I don't want to get sidetracked because yeah. I know that's part of the conversation, but anyways, back to the mental health stuff. I just wonder, you know, uh, I think about Ron Artest, I think about Dennis Rodman, you know, if you watch the last yeah. dance and, um, yeah. uh, some of what we pick up even from, from what Dennis shares, um, in that, in that series, you know, some of these things would have been taken seriously earlier, how things may have, I don't yes. know if we're, we're in the, we're, we're navigating the conversation in this way of like the, mm. I can't believe Simone and Naomi wouldn't compete at such a high level. Um, what are they talking about mental health? Like it's not that big of a deal or there's is definitely, I say growing compassion that has come and yeah. understanding that has come now, but I do wonder, yeah. How different would that have been? Um, if, if they had been taken, taken seriously. Instead and, of being entertained by Dennis Rodman yeah. and his hair and tattoos yep. and Las Vegas stories, like, well, yeah. like, get to understand where he's coming from. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's even another layer to the mouse at the palace. that was triggered originally by, you know, the Detroit and Ben Wallace. Uh, well, I guess he got fouled, but anyway, mm -hmm. yeah, I had just, you know, and this is no one's fault, but it was still uh, just a peek into what these athletes deal with. His brother had just passed away Yeah, and he's out there yeah. playing in a heated game. Mm -hmm. And yeah, again, it's the responsibilities on him, but just, it was eye opening to understand Very. more of like, very. With the backdrop of people saying, you know, these big, uh, big black guys out there that are mm -hmm. dangerous, mm -hmm. and how that language, people believe that language, and yeah. I'm appreciative of the light that was, you know, shed on something again mm -hmm. that was uh, absolutely awful. Um, but it's, I think, disingenuous to not un try and understand. Mm -hmm. um, where people are coming from more in these kinds of situations. Yeah. Again, I think, uh, again, I, I'll come back to it. I said it a little bit ago and I, I just think this is so important. Just understanding people's humanity. Right. Yes. I, I think, you know, let's remove the like professional athlete, multimillionaire, all the things let's remove that. Right. Like, let's just sit here and let's have a conversation and talk about, you know, for me, if it, there's, um, I'm a person with real feelings who's navigated a lot of trauma and grief in my life. Right. And so, um, for me, it's by God's grace that I'm, uh, know the people that I know and that I haven't, um, uh, yeah. It, it, even I think last summer where there was like a six week stretch where I felt some depression and stuff I've never had to navigate before to where my friends had to intervene and say, this is not, this is not who, who, where you're not yourself. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and we see what's contributing to it. And so we need to change your environment. Right. Yeah. Um, and that was for me just a short moment, but even what I felt was like this, I don't know how to deal with this. And so, um, again, I, I think if we can remove all of the, like, just perform and entertain me and just say like, you're a human first and foremost, who feels things deeply, our brains are wired in different ways and we experience things differently and we respond to things differently. What's our environment, the people around us. Um, and, to, to have more compassion, um, right. Yeah. 17 years later, we watch a documentary and we have more compassion for Ron Artest, Jermaine O'Neal and Steven Jackson, right. Even Ben Wallace in that moment, yeah. I didn't know that his brother had died right yeah. before that game. Right. I don't think um, most people didn't. Yeah. And so for me, it isn't a removal of, um, owning your decisions, right. I'm not, there's no, it's not like let's justify all of their actions, no one is, I'm not saying that. I won't say, I'm not saying that. However, what it does 
is it helps for me. It was to humanize them even more. I mean, as a 17 year old, I thought the, the media language was so problematic. The narrative of like, they're just thugs, right? Mm-hmm. Y'all don't even want to get into why are the inner cities the way they are? Mm-hmm. Y'all don't want to talk about that, mm-hmm. right? Again, that those racist tropes are connected to a larger historical narrative. And there's a reason inner cities look and function the way that they do yeah. that people don't want to talk about. Another conversation for another time, mm-hmm. right? But the media plays such a significant factor so often in that. And so anyways, um, if we can just humanize people and, and be able to have some compassion. And again, we're not in those moments. We don't know everything that's factored into them. Right. But if we could step back for a moment and say, okay, hold on. (laughs) Um, here's a little of what they shared. Wow. Simone said, I've got the twisties and the twisties are very dangerous where I could, you know, I I saw a gymnast say that they're paralyzed because they, they, they flipped and had the twisties and how they landed. Right. Yeah. That immediately should say, I don't understand that. I'm not a gymnast. I didn't know that was a thing. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Simone, you do what you need to do. You should not Versus, be out here flipping, girl. <laughs> get back out there. We want to see you perform. Yeah. yeah. And I think even I think there is even um, you know, we you mentioned mama mentality earlier, right? And you know, we see the clips of Kobe, right? Where he tore his Achilles and he said, No, let me shoot these free throws before I go out, or broke his finger put it back in place, get back out there, right? Which a number of athletes do that, mm-hmm. um, you know, in the gym hours before and after, and, and you, you just have to push through. And, and I think there's elements of mama mentality that are really helpful for athletes and mm-hmm. challenge athletes and hold athletes and people. We could take principles from mama mentality and apply it to ourselves and our work ethic and some of those things. How at the same time, I think there's, oh, there's a point where it becomes problematic or unhealthy. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, again, you factor, take, taking that in a way connected to just a larger, uh, general narrative for athletes of you just push through, you don't, <laughs> you don't pay attention to your body. Mm-hmm. And so, okay. So we see that. And now what are we seeing the ramifications of those types of things for athletes where you have former NFL players, um, who have died or have significant brain injury because they were told to play through concussions. Yeah. Some people would call that, they would want to say, oh, it's like mom, the mentality. You just push through. You couldn't see and you were dizzy, but it's you're, you could walk. that I got Kobe right here behind my, uh, over my shoulder. <laughs> no, that's dope. I love it. And it's, <laughs> I, and I have a lot of respect, right. For, for who Kobe was. Yeah. And, um, and, and I think again, the mama mentality, I think is actually, there's so much good in it. Right. And the way that it pushes athletes, I think it's, that's, it's tied into a larger conversation of, um, the expectation athletes are, um, have for themselves in some ways that mm. people put on them, that sports in general puts on them and that society at large will put on them. Um, and what it does is it removes compassion. It removes empathy. It removes, um, seeing them as human in so many ways. Um, when yes. we're pushing our bodies to points, that's really actually not healthy, whether mentally or even physically. Yeah. Um, and you're seeing now the long-term effects of those decisions. And so if we could have more compassion and empathy, we, um, hopefully don't demonize and dehumanize athletes in certain ways or, um, you know, I even think it's interesting, the double standard that's present. I actually just had to look this up because I want to make a note of this and the, even the mental health, um, conversation and the mentality of athletes and the double standard. So most of the response to Simone was pretty, I thought, uh, encouraging number of athletes, right. Um, Novak, uh, Djokovic, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce his last name. I, I've always struggled with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but one of the best in the world, right. Yeah. He's always up there with Federer. Um, and he's competing in the bronze medal match in Tokyo and loses his ish, breaks his rackets and has, throws a temper tantrum. Well, right before that, he condemned Simone Biles for her decision to not compete. Mm. And I thought, well, Novak, why are you getting so upset while you're competing? I thought, can't you just push through and <laughs> everything will be fine? Like, come on, get yourself together. Like, that's just what you're supposed to do, but you're going to throw, throw a fit. And, and losing this bronze medal match. And I'm sure blame it on some other people too. And so yeah. again, that's the layered complex nuance part of the conversation. Again, as, as athletes are trying to navigate the mental health stuff, the expectations put on them by society and then in sports in general, sports culture, um, and then a double standards. These are often not always, but they're often at play at the same time, which I always find interesting. Yeah. Um, not always though, right? Some, some are not that complex or layered, but a lot of them are. And so, 
you just see how these things are interconnected, right? I think yes. that's what it comes to is it's not just the mental health thing and it's just, it's thing over here, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's connected and layered in so many ways, like race is factored into that history is factored into that gender can be factored into that at times. Uh, what sport you play uh, yep. is factored into that. And then your background and upbringing, all these things get factored into that. And then what support do you have around you to navigate some of those things? And so for, again, for me, I'm always trying to understand kind of the, what's beneath the surface. Like something's happening what's causing it. And I don't always know, I don't know every detail, but I want to understand it. And I think as fans, fans, we don't do that. We just want to see athletes compete and call it a day and yeah. like be excited and have this adrenaline rush because we got to, we watched the crazy tennis match where Naomi beats Serena or yeah. like Kobe hit the game winner or all those moments that we yeah. want. And then it's like, I can't go to sleep because my adrenaline's rushing because I saw this exhilarating game. Right. And it's like, yeah, but then she's going to leave and Naomi leaves the court and her entire world changed in an yeah, instant. Yeah. There's n all the media stuff increased. She couldn't walk from one place to another without the fans wanting pictures or having her sign stuff. And she's like, I'm an introvert. I need my space, you know, like man. very overwhelming. Yeah. And so anyways, I, I think we need more compassion and more empathy and, a and work hard to bring, to have more understanding uh, with, what we're seeing and, and just seeing them as human. I, I think yeah. that's a big part of, of what we've been missing. Um, that's and good. some of what we saw surface, uh, in the last few months. Yeah. That's good. That's really, really helpful. <laughs> All right. I want to touch on one of the journalism stories out there. So I got one more kind of question for yep. you. And I know you got some feelings about this one. So I <laughs> wanted to ask you about, uh, ESPN's, I think she's still ESPN's Rachel Nichols mm -hmm. and Maria Taylor. If you don't know who they are two journalists, Rachel Nichols um, was at this point, host of NBA show daily NBA show called the jump um, young white woman journalist, um, kind of the face upcoming face, I think of an aspect of um, female reporters on ESPN. And then Maria Taylor, um, a little bit younger, Younger black um, reporter who has really taken off over, I think, the last couple of years. I don't watch quite as much ESPN lately, but both both good journalists. Maria Taylor has made a very quick ascension, and she's she's phenomenal regardless of mm, what race so is. Good. She's fan. I mean, so her good. takes are incredible. Yep. Um, her social commentary intertwined with sports. Obviously, we both are about that. Um, so maybe a little partial, but she's uh, fantastic and she's just gotten, it seems like more and more platforms and I've just been tracking like, man, yeah, get it. She is, mm -hmm. she's, um, just on her way. I wasn't putting it together that she was getting these. And then there comes out that Rachel Nichols gets caught, um, recorded behind the scenes off, off mic, off camera, venting about her disdain for, ESPN and Maria Taylor, but mostly her position that, mm -hmm. um, kind of usurping Rachel Nichols. So, and she's caught, I should have gotten the uh, audio to play it, but I mean, she's straight caught talking to somebody saying that she's upset that Maria's taking her or getting all these jobs ahead of her. Mm -hmm. And she kind of blasts ESPN altogether saying, you know, if you want to, you know, don't blame me or take it out on me that you're, um, with these performative acts of wokeness, mm -hmm. I think was the I got, word, the, I was got the word. a quote right here. If okay, you yeah, read go it. For it. yeah. Uh, so she said in the interview that, yeah, the, that leaked, uh, Rachel says, if you need to give her more, her we're referring to Maria Taylor, if you need to give her more things to do because you are feeling pressure about your crappy long time record on diversity, yeah. which by the way, I know personally from the female side of it, like go for it, just find it somewhere else. You're not going to find it from me or taking my thing away. Mm, yeah, so she's caught. It doesn't know she's being recorded. That comes out. She mm -hmm. issues, which I watched, um, an apology on the jump about all that happening. And fast forward to, I think, just a couple of days ago. Yeah. She's officially removed and mm -hmm. is off the show. I don't mm -hmm. know if she's fired from ESPN, but she's off the show. 
Um, Maria Taylor's still just doing her thing. I think it's been great. I think she's actually just seems like she stayed out of it, which is great. She was mm-hmm. covering the Olympics, still doing her thing, covered the NBA, the finals, all that stuff, which Rachel was salty about because I think she wanted to do. Anyway, yep. really bad for Rachel Nichols. Quote, there's not, I don't think there's much justifying it other than, sure, she, she might have a point with maybe ESPN. We can blame a little on ESPN of, sure, maybe they are, and otherwise, not even with Maria Taylor, like maybe the backdrop is that they are trying to make up in different ways that mm-hmm. maybe we don't even know about mm-hmm. in a performative way mm-hmm. in light of last year and BLM and George Floyd and stuff. But what, what did you see the apology? What did you make of the apology? And do you think what's happened with both of their career? Well, I guess Rachel's career is justified specifically with her being removed from the show. Yeah, I, I didn't see uh, her apology. Um, yeah, I was a little, I was like a week or so even behind because um, I hadn't been on Twitter, which I feel like that became my news source. And I've been off okay. Twitter for several months now. Um, so I saw it on Instagram probably like a week or so later about the comments. And so I was playing a little bit of catch up and, um, I had heard that she apologized, but I didn't watch it. And yeah, then just saw the news that, um, they canceled the jump. And from the article I was just, um, reading through, she's still, I believe employed by ESPN. Um, but was just, yeah, they canceled her show and yeah. And so it's, again, it's, um, unfortunate isn't, is, is a word I'll use, but I feel like it's, it's more than that. Right. It's a, um, you know, ESPN is like a lot of other networks and organizations, right? We see this common yeah. thread across the board, especially in the last year or two, where they're like, oh, crap, we don't have enough diversity out there. So sure. we're going to scramble and um, either in some ways promote people who actually aren't qualified or prepared for that type of job. And then it proves a point of like, we'll see, like, they're not ready. Uh, that's, or they weren't good at it. So why would we do that? Right. So there's that, that element of that tip tends to happen or you get the, like, Oh, we got the one person. So we're going to put him or her in everything. Right. Um, I, in my opinion, Maria Taylor, the opportunities that she has gotten, um, largely are due because she is so good at what she does. Her versatility to cover. I mean, she'll go from covering, pro sports get on the plane and then go cover a college football game like she did that multiple times last year i was like this is i'm fascinated by this right the prep for all of that it's incredible and she's just so good at what she does now was there some probably um ulterior motive on espn's part there's a good chance that that's true as well right there's two we know multiple things can be true at the same time right, right. so my assumption is that it was a bit of an ulterior motive for espn to say We're going to capitalize on Maria's skill set and then boom, she checks the box. So she's a black woman and we look good right now. They may never admit that we can make all the assumptions we want to, Um, you know, and so for Rachel Nichols, you know, if I'm trying to put myself in her shoes, um, I could see um, a layer of animosity of frustration. Maybe she heard the conversations or because she's been around ESPN so long, she knows she, you know, you, you can read between the lines, you know, what's happening. Right. Mm-hmm. But then what happens is, and I'm not saying this is what should happen. I'm not saying it's like, Oh, let's take away from Rachel's opportunities and just give them to Maria because Maria is black. Right. Yeah. Um, some of the issues with like, when we talk about like affirmative action and, and there's so that's a whole nother thing that I'm not about to get into. Right. And so for, for Rachel, I can see an element of, um, well, I'm, I'm good at what I do, right? I'm different than Maria. I'm good at what I do. I've, I've got a phenomenal resume and you're just going to simply take from my opportunities to, to give to Maria because she's black. And really the fault of that lies on ESPN, right? Yeah. Now, Rachel <laughs> needs to understand um, what happens though in that is it becomes a self-preservation. So it's a, yeah, give Maria opportunities, but this is mine, Right. Um, there's a choice sometimes where we say, actually this person, I know I'm good at what I do, but this person deserves this opportunity. So I'm going to remove myself from leading or taking that job or whatever the case may be, right. Personal decisions people make, which I think is really incredible. Um, you know, but for Rachel, what, what I'm, what I sensed to that was, uh, some of the self-preservation of a, I did what I did. This is mine. And 
you're not going to take that from me simply because you've been in the wrong, but not recognizing her comments, how disparaging they were towards Maria yeah. and how, uh, how they were minimizing towards Maria and her resume and her skill set. And skillset, so that's, yeah. that's where the miss was on Rachel's end. And I think it was an opportunity for Rachel to learn sadly. Um, it costs her something. I mean, it should have cost her something, but also of, of, um, just how it treated Maria, you know? And so, um, and to be fair, she was unknowingly recorded. True. And there was, so I mean, there that. was that element. I, I'm kind of in the place of like, uh, I think uh, Maria Taylor is amazing and mm-hmm. is fantastic at her job, but mm-hmm. whether or not there's performative stuff going on with ESPN, cause there probably is. But, um, mm-hmm. like you said, I think the, disparagement towards her is mm-hmm. she, she was wronged in this, yep. whether or not it was, you know, unknowingly recorded and stuff. And I think I'm okay with personally, not even really have an opinion on whether or not, you know, Rachel Nichols should lose her job or not. I, it, or lose her spot, at least on the jump. Mm-hmm. I just think it's something to do what we're doing, thinking about the elements that are at play at the same time. Yeah. Um, Cause I think like you're saying, like it's important to understand all the different elements in ESPN is mm-hmm. the umbrella on, over both of them. And they pay the bills. They, yep. <laughs> and make the money, mm-hmm. which we always come back to. Yeah. I, I don't, again, I, I think that this situation in particular, right. There are some that are way more egregious where people should, your show should get canceled. You should lose mm-hmm. your job. Right. Um, you know, I think about the announcer, who referred to a bunch of, it was a, a, um, a basketball girls basketball team out in Oklahoma, predominantly black, if not all black. And I believe referred to use the N word on yeah, air, saw that. right? High school. Oh, you most certainly should lose your job. Yeah. There, Correct. No, I, I, that's I, a great comparison. A, boom. Yep. Okay. So do I think Rachel should have the, the jump should have been canceled? I don't <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Like I, while it was her comments were very unkind and disparaging towards Maria and it it revealed some of Rachel's need to do some work and understanding, um, whether she was recorded or not, she still said it and she believed it. And so I think that's the element too. I think sometimes we like, well, if they weren't recorded, we wouldn't know Well, we wouldn't, but she still said it and she still believed it. Very very hurtful. Yeah. And so for Rachel, it it is eye opening for her to do some of the inner work to say what, where are the questions that she needed to pose or ask or press ESPN producers on not yeah. make it about Maria yeah, and about this. Right. And so, but I don't, for me personally, I'm like, I, I don't, um, uh, I, I don't know if, I don't think the jump should have been canceled, but okay. Like yeah. Rachel's still going to get opportunities, you know, um, right. hopefully she's doing some of the inner work to understand. Um, and then we, we keep it pushing. Right. And yeah. so, but again, I think it was one of those, like, it wasn't this like, it was a big deal because of the names. It was Rachel Nichols and Maria Taylor. Yeah. So that's why it, it, it became such big news and whatnot. Um, the, the situation of itself, you know, um, was not like on like the extreme of the example I just used about the announcer in Oklahoma yet. It's still connected to a larger narrative. And again, I think that's where it's not like this isolated incident. It's this, okay, this is one of many, um, ways where these types of things have been fall- have responded where, and it comes out with white women sometimes in these situations. Right. Yeah. And some of the projections that come out or the, um, well, yeah, I want all women to, mm. you know, have opportunities. Just don't take mine. Yep. Cause it's mine. I worked hard for that. And um, my question is Maria didn't work hard though. Yeah. <laughs> Again, whether their motives were bad or not, Maria has worked her butt off and she's good at mm-hmm. what she does not to say they should be solely taken away from Rachel because simply because Maria is black and Rachel's yeah. white. Right. That's, that is messy. And as problematic, yeah. there's so many opportunities in a company like ESPN and so much to cover in the sports world that Rachel can do the jump and Rachel and Maria can do NBA stuff and host NBA countdown. But I'm sure there was a moment of yeah, put hmm, them both on Rachel's Rachel's at the finals, but Maria's hosting mm-hmm. NBA countdown. Right. Yeah. So there's that, but you, you both can do it. You can yeah. coexist in the yeah. same place. And Rachel, in all fairness, you've been doing stuff like this for a long time. You know, you've got some years on Maria. This is an incredible opportunity for Maria to host NBA countdown. Yeah. That's a big deal. <laughs> so yeah. uh, again, it, it might, it might seem super small and in some, in some, uh, 
in some ways it is compared to some other, some of the other like racial incidents. Yeah. Um, however, again, I think it's connected to like that larger narrative. So, um, Rachel will get her opportunities that we know that, um, yeah, yeah. I know people enjoy the jump. I had never watched it, so I can't, it's uh, right. can't say I'm sad about it. So <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> All right. This has been amazing. Leith. Yeah. I appreciate you jumping on here again. I'm mean, seriously mm-hmm. encyclopedia of sports knowledge. <laughs> amazing in, insight into these hard, hard topics to navigate. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't have a whole, uh, list this time but uh, i mean last question here we go who who uh i'm sorry i'm not gonna go WNBA this time because i just want to hear um okay. your, your nba take for me <laughs> who wins with all these off-season moves um, yo <laughs> lakers who uh <laughs> who wins who gets it done this year is Le- you're a lebron fan though right so are i they, am are a they LeBron gonna get it done fan. Um, with this old man roster yeah yeah the old heads you know uh, i've seen a lot of the chatter about mm-hmm. you know yeah we can talk about that of you know there's oppor- miss, some missed opportunity potentially with some get some younger guys in there man this nba season is going to be so interesting to see lebron Melo, and russ and ad i like on the same i like team. people counting them out because when it when oh, for sure when we get it for done sure. i don't want to hear anyone say lebron can only win with super team because yeah. right now, that's not it. Right now, it's it, all yeah. they can't get it done. They're old. They're yep. going to lose. Yep. And so yep. that's fine. A Wa- little washed up. That's fine. Yeah. So for me, um, because I'm a LeBron fan, I still cannot lead with a uh, that I'm a Lakers fan. Mm-hmm. Being mm-hmm. a LeBron right. fan by default makes me cheer for the Lakers. That's where I still am. Um, I know we're a few years into this thing now, mm. but... Uh, it's a slow process for me. <laughs> uh, so all you haters out there that are shaking your heads right now, hearing me say that it's fine. I am, I'm content where I am all that to say, um, because they're being counted out in that way too. And because I feel like the, the Lakers past season, you know, there was so much potential and then the injuries plagued them and like a number of other teams too. Um, I want the Lakers to win, uh, cause that would just be there dope, uh, for Russ. I think about Russ and I yeah. think about Melo yeah. and, like the really phenomenal careers, you know, what yeah. Melo overcame when he was out of the league for over a year, the way he, the fallout from the Knicks and to see him kind of find his footing again with the trailblazers and outside of his personal life, you know, I, I think what Melo has done on the court has been incredible. And obviously Russ mm-hmm. breaking Oscar Robertson's triple double record and he's a freak, bouncing man. around like as much as I'm a LeBron fan, I'm like, man, that would just be really dope for Russ and Melo. So so I'm cheering for LeBron and uh, the Lakers, um, but it's going to be an interesting season for yeah. sure with all the moves. So, with them, it's all about health. Yeah. If one of those guys goes down, they're done. But if they're healthy, yeah. Similarly I don't, I don't with, think with anyone, the Nets, yeah, yeah. Similarly with the Nets, right? Was what we saw, and there mm-hmm. was that expectation, and then the injuries. You know, there's only yeah. so much. KD can only score. You know, he can only do so much, and they couldn't <sighs> get over that hump. And so, um, so I think it's going to be a very interesting season with those moves, but. To answer your question, you know, I hope the the Lakers are you know the ones yeah. holding up the the trophy at the at the end of the season. So there that's my answer. You and me both. <laughs> you and me both, Code. Yep. <laughs> All right, Leith. I'll let you go. I know we gotta go. I appreciate you uh, taking taking a little bit of time. To come on here with me. Yeah, David. Thanks for having me. It's it's just fun to chop it up with you. I really enjoy this. It's it's really fun. So, um, hope y'all are enjoying the podcast. David is dope. Um, yeah, it's good to get to be on here twice. I feel very honored. Hey, anytime, uh, anytime you're welcome here, back. So there's always stuff happening. You. Yeah. Um, everyone, listen. Be sure to check out the roll down. I know they're gonna uh, they're working on season two. We were talking a little bit before we yes, recorded coming we are. out um, over on the Chasing Justice podcast network. Amazing stuff you and uh, Matthew Coase are doing over there, too. So, mm, Thank you, friend. All right. Peace out. Thank you all again so much for listening. This podcast was created to elevate the voices of the BIPOC community and our allies and to invite anyone else to listen and learn and grow with us. As always, don't forget to check out the show notes for all of the links to the recommendations we shared. Our artwork was created by the great Ashley Bush, and the music you are listening to was created and produced by the also great Dylan Dent.